Hello and welcome everyone to our fireside chat at GRC, discovering your optimal translation mix. I'm Gavin Grimes, VP of Language Services here at Smartlink, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Liliana Pardo, Senior Manager of Localization at Vimeo, and Patricia Sines, Web Translation Program Manager at SAS. First of all, thank you so much for joining me. Really genuinely thrilled that you, you could join us. And maybe, uh, Liliana, I'll start with you. Could you give us a quick overview of your company, uh, the role, and where that localization team fits within Vimeo? Yes, thank you so much, Gavin, for inviting us to be part of this uh, panel, this conversation. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the Senior uh, Manager for Localization at Vimeo. Um, what that means is I um, look at what our company needs in terms of localization, and I plan with them the strategies that make the most sense for us in terms of operations and um, just the things that we should prioritize. Um, yeah. And... Uh, then Vimeo is um, an all-in-one video software solution. Um, we um, enable professionals, teams, and organizations to unlock the power of video for collaborations and um, all the needs they may have. Uh, we have over 287 million users um, wow. that range from uh, creators and entrepreneurs um, and um, the world's largest company. We report uh, to the uh, marketing team, more specifically to the marketing operations team. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Liliana. Patricia, same to you. Uh, kind of overview of the company, your role and where the localization team fits uh, within the within uh, SAS. Of course. Thanks, uh, first of all, for having us here today. It's a pleasure to be with this amazing audience. Uh, yes. Well, I will start with SAS for the ones who uh, don't know about this company. It's a global software and solutions company is the founder of analytics and has been leading the market for nearly 50 years, empowering and inspiring customers to transform their data into intelligence, helping them take in smarter and faster decisions with confidence through the use of analytics and AI. SAS has customers um, in more than 140 countries from different uh, industries that goes from banking, government, retail, healthcare, um, just to name a few. And it has been growing year after year, reporting last year a $3 billion revenue. And I'm proud to say that it has been considered as one of the uh, top companies as a great place to work. My journey started at SAS um, 15 years ago in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where I was leading digital marketing strategy and operational team for Latin America. Two years later, I uh, expand this role globally. And in 2015, I grabbed my husband, my kids, try to pack my life into a <laughs> few bags and move into Cary, North Carolina, to take the challenge to start uh, from scratch the translation program for some uh, SaaS business units. I was able to evolve those units into the localization maturity model from manual to agile, onboarding almost 16 languages. Two years ago, um, I decided to focus 100% on the web translation program that I'm currently managed inside the digital experience department, that's a business unit are reporting to. And we currently onboard, train, support, and coordinate more than 100 users that works on the translation job as a side job. And um, we also coordinate multiple LSPs to make sure that all the steps are executed on time. As most of you know, Three out of four web users um, don't speak English at all. So our goal is to provide an amazing and consistent uh, web experience across all markets to reach bigger global audiences. Fantastic. Sounds like two super interesting companies to work for. 
Um, before we go on, actually, I'm always curious of where localization departments sit within other other companies. So maybe one for the audience, maybe put into the chat and share where your respective localization departments sit. And uh, it's interesting kind of data point for us. Um, um, maybe Liliana, we, we'll start with you. Um, from a kind of where we are today, could you give us maybe a, a feel for the localization strategy in Vimeo and maybe highlighting the types of content and the audiences that you're translating for? I think um, uh, Patricia already highlighted some of the elements. I mean, I'd be interested to hear from you about your current strategy. Yes, um, I'll start by saying that the localization strategy has evolved a lot in my time at Vimeo. I joined the company eight years ago, and uh, back then, even the company was viewed as a viewing destination for video content, mm. and our target audience was video creators and video professionals. So back then, I was a translator, and really the localization strategy was, here's the website, here's our software, here's the knowledge base, just translate it into the six languages. Um, I don't really know why those languages were picked, but I was a translator, so I did my job. Um, and with the time, it was actually the uh, translators, you know, we have experience um, doing this. We were the ones who started informing what the localization strategy should be at Vimeo. Um, and we were the ones bringing awareness to that, to the people in charge of the localization team back then. Um, through this journey, um, Vimeo acquire other companies and it went from being a viewing destination to being an end-to-end -end, um, video solutions platform. And the audience grew from just video professionals and creatives to include um, businesses, organizations. Um, and uh, so I will say that for most of that time, the strategy to be here's a website here's their software just translated but right. during the pandemic we increased demand in video solutions you know everyone went remote everyone needed to host town halls to have live events and uh, vimeo grew exponentially um we created an in-market sales force and an international marketing team during this time so our team started partnering with them um really looking into what were the needs for these specific markets. And we started translating now, not just the website, but the demand materials, demand gen uh, materials and programs. We started translating some um, sales CRM sequences, stuff that we hadn't done before. We started going into, but I'll say that that was kind of like a reactive need, like, okay, yeah. here we have now, we need to support these teams, let's do it. Um, and that has helped us learn, you know, like really look into what it's like a more strategic approach. And that's exactly where we are right now. Um, we are looking at maybe creating a tiering system for these markets. Mm -hmm. And um, what is it, what we want to, what's that holistic localization approach we want to take at Vimeo? Because now it's really seen as this enterprise level solution with global presence. We have people reaching out, telling us what they need specifically for this market. So um, yeah, that's that's our that's our strategy right now. I've been in the industry for a long time, uh, longer than I than I care to admit. Uh, but uh, it, throughout that time, 20, 25 years, there's been a number of uh, pretty definitive inflection points. And I think we've reached another one of those inflection points. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts and maybe starting with you, Patricia, of where do you where where are we currently as an industry? Uh, what what's your what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, the industry has evolving indeed. And I would say that the most uh, significant change has been the increasing adoption on, on NMT, neural machine translation, which as you guys know, is completely different from statistical machine translation where everybody were like, this is not going to work for us. Um, and I can also see as well, a lot of AI-related uh, technology like um, natural language processing, machine learning also apply to the industry. This is shifting a little bit or changing the role of the human translator 
that uh, is getting more used to refine and indeed machine generated translations versus um, starting from scratch. I still believe that expertise and more skilled linguistics will play a key role in all this evolution. I also noticed that there is, um, you know, finding the balance between cost and quality continues remaining a challenge. So the key to success will be to find that balance and the ability to have in one side the need to optimize cost and use the efficiency and automation, and on the other side, the need for accuracy, nuance, and cultural uh, sensitivity. I don't know what you think, Liliana, about this. Yeah, I think this is actually a fascinating topic. I am a trained translator. Translator, and for a really long time, uh, I've been skeptical about machine translation and AI power engines taking over the craft. You know, I'm, I'm always like, yeah, I don't think so. Um, but um, also, as a project manager and now a team lead, I've seen the benefits, you know, in terms of turnaround time and cost efficiencies. And these two things are a big part of what leadership and our stakeholders are looking at. Mm -hmm. So um, I will say now that we're hearing more about these trainable engines that they can leverage your glossaries and your translation memory, um, I will say I have a mix of anticipation, curiosity, and excitement. Um, I still have to experience, you know, the difference between like regular stock machine translations and AI uh, machine translation engines. But um, I think it's fascinating. I don't know if I have a definitive opinion on it right now. Um, but yes, I, I will be interested to to hear what what the audience thinks about this as well. And and yeah, for, for sure. And so. With the evolution of AI and what we call here at Smartling uh, language AI, and there is, you know, you know, advancements in quality and speed and in cost. Does that what level of influence does that have on your internal strategies or are you beginning to incorporate them into conversations internally? And um, maybe, uh, Patricia, you could maybe start with that one. Yeah, of course. Um, in 2018, we started to explore NMT raw to see how we can benefit from it. And we start to test language by language. And currently, all of our languages are supported by NMT. Uh, I haven't mentioned this, but we work under a decentralized model where decisions and budget sits on the regional side and also the um, option to work with different vendors. So managing different vendors and uh, working with them, sometimes it's challenging and time consuming. So having NMT on our workflows was a game changer for us. Uh, we could only, uh, we, we were able not only to decrease cost, turn around time, but also increase the volume. Mm -hmm. Um, our workflows all have an NT and human review. Human in the loop is always there. We had two different steps. It could be NMT post-editing done by agencies for languages like Korean, for example, where we cannot find a decent NMT engine that provides us decent uh, quality. And then we have always, as mandatory, uh, human reviewed done by our internal local reviewers on site in each country that ensure that our content resonates with our audiences. Um, we also work for a specific and high creative compelling content with dedicated LSPs where we don't have or we don't um, integrate neural machine translation there. And we work with specific services like transcreation, copy editing, adaptation. Mm -hmm. And we know um, the cost is higher and the turnaround times, but it's completely worth it. I think for the optimal translation mix, companies need to consider the amount of content 
type of content, budget, and audience. For sure. Liliana, I'd be interested to get your kind of, um, your take on that also. Yes, I think these advancements in the technology really opens the conversation at Vimeo to rethink the translation mix that we have in place. Um, in terms of the more volume heavy projects that we have, we're already using machine translation plus professional editing workflows. Um, we have different engines, you know, that we, we, we pick the ones that work best for our language pairs. And we've been using that, I think, also since around like 2018. Um, um, I will say that, um, if anything, these advancements um, are making us think if there is a chance for us to actually just have raw machine translations for low visibility content. Because even that uh, machine translation content that I mentioned before, it always goes through our professional editing. Um, but now if we can leverage, you know, using our glossaries and our translation memory, I think it, it gives us more confidence on maybe just having raw machine translation, knowing that the engine has been trained with our content and that we don't have to review if, you know, our brand names or our product names are being translated or that very specific Vimeo terminology, it's it's consistent yeah. through the site. So those are the things that um, we're rethinking right now. And then we're also thinking if maybe that machine translation plus professional editing workflow, we can open it up to different types of content, maybe start using it for product, maybe start using it for low touch uh, marketing content, you yeah. know, and just finding those efficiencies. Um, it's it's really for us thinking, you know, where can we spend most of our time in, in like strategic thinking and not so much in manual tasks, you know, and just making sure, um, for sure. where we can leverage this. For mm -hmm. sure. As part of my day to day in my role, I talk to uh, lots of customers uh, cust uh, and clients all over the world and they have they're having similar conversations internally. And, you know, and we're in somewhat uncertain econo economic times. And how does that kind of current macro economic environment influence strategy as well? Is that focusing uh, in on, hey, we're doing a lot of human translation. Do we really need to do that that amount of human translation? Do we get more bang of bang for a book? with that kind of uh, different translation mix. Maybe, uh, Patricia, could you maybe talk a little bit about how the economic environment is playing a role in your in your strategy? Yes, um, I think the pandemic and economic pressure on companies led to a focus more on cost optimization and efficiency, and translations is not an exception on that. AI is helping us to scaling up translation efforts without significantly increased cost. Another way that we are uh, trying to optimize our translation strategies is focusing on top priority content and markets and allocating efforts where it makes more sense and will produce greater impact in, ter in terms of uh, generating growth and, and revenue. Last year, what we did was um, we deploy, we created and deploy an extensive internal research study that included split URL testing into nine languages and a survey into 20 languages to try to understand the impact that translations had on brand perception and users' engagement. The results were eye-opening for us and we are using that data to guide us um, in terms of resources allocation and efforts. Like, as you said, do more with less. So yeah. we also we were able to confirm the impact that providing a consistent customer experience actually had. I think that a weak localization strategy can undermine uh, the ability of a company to succeed the companies that can find the right optimal translation mix will be able to succeed and um, in this context and beat competitors as well. For sure, um, uh, absolutely. Liliana, is it similar from your side or are you seeing it differently? 
No, I think it's similar. Um, it is forcing us uh, to be more intentional with how we spend our dollars. So really what Patricia mentioned, you know, what's the priority content? What are the priority markets? Yeah. Um, you know, not doing a blanket approach for everything. It's really unsustainable, unscalable. So it is, um, it is forcing us to be more intentional, to look at the processes that we have in place. So maybe start using AI, things that for us have been so like, I feel that at Vimeo, we're very protective with um, the quality of the translations. And, you know, it's the brand coming through in our markets. Um, but yes, it, it is, it's coming to a point that, you know, um, there are um, big advancements in this technology. And also, we do want to do more with less. That's I think our mantra for this year as well. I, I yeah. think that's a, a common theme. It's certainly something we're, we're working hard here at Smartling on is, the, you know, enabling our, our, our client base to, to do uh, more with less. Um, I'd be interested to hear from the audience, actually, of what they feel their current translation mix is. And what I mean by that is percentage of human, percentage of MT, percentage of MTPE versus what they think it will be in the next six, 12 months. So maybe put that in the chat also. Um, so how different do you think your team or your strategy uh, will look at the end of 2023 versus the end of 2022? Maybe, uh, Patricia, you can you can you can start us out with that one. Of course, I think in terms of the team, I had to say that fortunately, based on this environment, will remain the same. No changes there. Okay. But in terms of strategy, uh, we will continue evolving with NMT. Right now, we are assessing the first steps to train um, NMT engines with terminology or database and see if we can decrease the amount of, of time spent by our internal reviewers and also decrease the time to market and improve quality. Um, the other thing we are very curious and we will also start assessing is the use of chat GDP gen mm -hmm. AI. It's a new territory, but I see a lot of potential there. Um, one thing we are moving on strongly is SEO. We created a new SEO translation process, um, adding efficiency by leveraging our tech stack in our proven translation process. So I would expect to see uh, better organic results. And with that, trying to expand this globally to other regions and boost our efforts in 2024. And um, the other thing is, as we are prioritizing core initiatives, um, I expect better results there to help us pave the way to a more centralization path um, yeah. for our division. Fantastic. Busy, busy times ahead. Liliana, how about you? Yes, I think uh, the differences um, we'll see, I think in terms of strategy would be um, maybe adding um, raw machine translation to our translation mix yep. and starting using machine translation plus professional editing um, for new types of content. Um, there is a lot of things we still do with human only workflows. And I think some things with what Pat Patricia was saying, we can find those efficiencies in shortening the time to market um, and just regular turnaround times without having to affect the quality for our end users. I think that's something we, we will be doing by the end of this year. And then um, I'll also say uh, a market tiering system. That's something we really, really need to stop being reactive and yeah. really have a like a more mature approach to localization at Vimeo. Fantastic, fantastic. Last question for me, because I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, so what do you need from, uh, you know, your LSP partners uh, to achieve your business goals over the next 12, 18 months? Maybe we'll, 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 we'll start with you again, uh, Liliana, on that one. Yes, um, so at Vimeo, uh, the localization team is two people strong right now. Yeah. So our language uh, service partners um, are really an extension of our team. We do rely on them heavily. Um, so I think having clear and regular communication with them, um, ensuring that they understand our brand 
um, and business, um, that's going to help, I think, in the consistency and the quality of the translations, the fluency, um, and really partnering also to um, help us stay up to date with trends and find efficiencies. You know, a lot of the times we get caught up in the day to day, what we need to do. um, And maybe they can identify something that, you know, we could be doing in a more efficient way. Um, I think all these things are are things that we we rely heavily on on our language service partners. Fantastic. And and Patricia? Uh, Well, we need to do some internal homework here towards centralization and yeah. try to consolidate multiple vendors into few that we can build a closer uh, partnership that could benefit us more. But in the ideal world, what I would expect an LSP and just one and not multiple to help us with is um, to provide guidance with our translation approach, of course, provide high quality translations, be open to work with new technologies, provide a wide variety of services that goes from NMT post-edit into trans creation. And last but not least, have in-country linguists and SME subject matter experts to ensure that the translations they create, provide, are uh, culturally, culturally appropriated for our audience. Fantastic. I feel like we could talk for a lot longer. And, I, and you know, this is kind of just a jumping off point in these conversations, which I'm sure most most companies will be having uh, over the next six, 12 months. So thank you both, both so much for joining. Uh, really, really ins- insightful um, information you both gave. And I hope the audience enjoyed as much as I did. Uh, if the audience have left questions in the Q&A tab, uh, we'll follow up after the conference and we'll get back quite quite soon afterwards. So again, thank you all so much and goodbye. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Bye.